Welcome to Brain the Vet. Today we're going to be talking to Travis Timmerman from Seton Hall University, and we're going to be talking about one of the biggest questions in life, death. Travis, would you like to start with a thought experiment? There's so many different factors that people think about when we think about death. We often think about how it'll affect our family. We think about how the process of dying, which is distinct from death, might be painful. We think about the anxiety that we might feel about perpetual nothingness. But I want to uh, ask about a case where none of these issues apply. So imagine someone who is a happy hermit. They enjoy their life very much. They have people that they're friendly with. They have some meaningful relationships, but they don't have a close network of people who will mourn their loss if they die. Uh, let's suppose furthermore that they have a, let's say incident that puts them in the hospital and they're faced with, uh, two choices. One that can push button a, that'll give them some medicine, that'll completely heal them. And then they'll be able to go on and live a life that we can just suppose is good on any account of meeting on any account of wealth. Or two, they can push a button B, we'll give them a bunch of morphine and it'll very quickly and completely painlessly kill them. And furthermore, let's suppose that their death is going to result in the permanent cessation of their existence. So it's not like they're going to go to heaven or hell and have some sort of positive or negative experiences after they make this choice. Let's just suppose if only for the sake of argument that this choice is going to result in either the continued existence on earth, or they'll be very happy and healthy for the remainder of their life and they choose to live, or they'll just immediately and permanently cease to exist. And the question that I am most interested in is if they choose to end their life, they hit button B, get the morphine and go out of existence, whether that would be bad for them in any way, would they suffer some sort of misfortune if they end their life? So I'm assuming your intuition in this case is that it would be bad for them if they die. And the reason being that this is a hermit, no one kind of depends on their existence. There won't be mass suffering at their loss, but that person would have had a very fulfilling life had they continued to exist instead of pressing the death button. So I'm assuming your intuition in this case is that death is bad for that person. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Pre-theoretically, even my intuitions are that, uh, death can be bad for people, even if it's completely painless, even if there's no negative experiences associated after death, even if there are people who are going to miss them after they die. The reason that I think it's bad is roughly known as the view uh, called deprivationism which says that it is bad in virtue of the goods that you missed out on as a result, as you put it, it's the things that they would have got had they not died when they did. The things that they're deprived of, the things that they miss out on are the results of ending their life prematurely. That's what makes it bad for them. It'll only be extrinsically bad. It'll be bad because it deprives you of good. It won't be bad uh, inherently. And I take it on that kind of deprivationist account. If your life was going to turn out to be pretty bad going forward. In other words, if you thought that the next six months of your life really would be lying in this hospital bed with no meaningful uh, experiences, an enormous amount of agony, you're not being deprived of anything. In fact, you might've received a benefit through the death. In other words, you avoided all this awful stuff that was going to happen to you. And so it would be good for you to die. If what we're measuring is the, let's say positive or negative, uh, net goods of your future. Yes, that's exactly right. So a lot of people want to preserve the judgment that death for at least humans is always and everywhere bad for them. Even Thomas Nagel, the originator of this view, wanted to defend that. And I deny that. I actually think it's a virtue of a standard form of deprivationism, that it gives an account of when death is good for you as well as when it's bad, because that can tell us when it's prudent to continue living, uh, versus dying. And we make these judgments, I think, implicitly all the time. People make those judgments when they make their own end of life decisions. People make those judgments on behalf of non-human animals. I've had 
dogs as pets for many years. And there's a point at which the quality of life decreases so much that, that it would be in their interest to end their life prematurely rather than to make them continue living. So I find it very interesting that you brought up pets because I was just thinking that. And this is something that has niggled at the back of my brain for many years. So you take your, your dog who's in tremendous pain to your vet and the vet says, well, we could perform an operation which may extend the dog's life, but it'll live in pain and its quality of life won't be great. Perhaps the humane thing to do is to just to put it down. We don't have those conversations about humans, right? So you go to the surgeon and the surgeon says, well, I can fix your broken leg, but you're going to struggle with it, man. You're going to struggle with it for the next few decades. It's just put you out of your misery. Now, what I find very interesting is when we think intuitively about a surgeon doing that, we balk. We, we say, no, there's something wrong with the surgeon. He's doing something awful. I'm, I'll live with the pain, that leg pain, but we don't have that intuition about the vet. Now your view, it seems can't account for that difference, right? I think it might be able to account for that difference. So let me give my best attempt at trying to account for this difference. And you tell me whether I'm uh, mistaken. So one reason we might balk at the surgeon for saying that, uh, first, if it's just a broken leg, that doesn't, I think, diminish your quality of life so much that it wouldn't be uh, worth living. The typical human uh, would be able to find things that they enjoy are so meaningful, even if they're incapacitated in such a way that they never regain the use of their leg. That is probably true for uh, lots of animals as well. But the point at which people tend to think it's good for the animal, for the non-human animal to be put down, is when their life contains much more pain than it would pleasure. That same judgment is true of humans, at least assuming, assuming hedonism is the correct account of well-being. Maybe desire satisfactionism, but roughly whenever there is going to be more bad than good in the subsequent life, I think it would be prudent to end that life, be it a human or non-human animal. Now, I, I think you put your finger on something really uh, interesting here, which is that my judgments might be out of line with common sense. I think people have particularly speciesist judgment about the quality of human versus non-human animal life. And this might be the sole instance where the speciesist judgments can be bad for the humans and actually benefit the non-human animals. So the species of judgment in question is there's something inherently good about being biologically human such that your life is always worth living, irrespective of how much pain you have to endure, irrespective of the cost that you take on to try to get the medication that you need to continue living, at least in places like the United States where the healthcare costs are just astronomical, right? You still have, uh, life for living independent of anything else. And I think people acting on those beliefs can actually harm humans in a way that non-human animals are spared. So I wonder if there's a distinction to be drawn between the human and the, and the, and the non-human. So you talked about it being in the animal's interest, but that's different from the animal having the interest. So we can imagine it being in a human being's interest to cease to exist because it will be the case that the rest of their life will be filled with untold suffering, but they don't have that interest. They have an interest in surviving. Now, the question is whether it would be uh, good, bad, or morally neutral to kill that person against their will. Cause you might say, well, if all we care about is adding up pleasure and pain points, when I kill this person through a mercy killing, even if they protest, it's in their interests. The the right sort of fatherly paternalist thing to do is to safeguard this person's interests. And I know as the specialist doctor that they're going to suffer a lot and I can end that. And you might even want to say, look, their interests are irrational. They've got this view that there's something intrinsically valuable about life, or they have some kind of bogus view about recovering. They're very hopeful that they're going to get out of stage four cancer. They're not, I know what's going to happen. It's just going to be, you know, awful from here on out. And so the right thing to do, if you care about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain is to kill this person against their will and set aside their irrational interests. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I think this is a very tricky issue that actually doesn't have, get enough attention 
in the literature. Yeah, there's, I think there's two sort of general differences between the typical human and the typical non-human animal. One is that they can have an interest in the sense that they have an opinion about what they want. They can exercise their autonomy in such a way where they say, no, I you know, have done estimated value calculus and I think it would be best for me to continue living. And insofar as we should care about autonomy over and above what we might think is good for people, we should respect that. Now, I don't have a position on that, but what I would want to say is we shouldn't treat death differently than we do other cases of people autonomously harming themselves. And sometimes it seems like we think the paternalistic thing is what we should do. Maybe if someone is an addict and their addiction is harming them and they say, my considered judgment is that I still want to continue to be an addict and not seek treatment. We think paternalism is the way to go. And other cases when people do things that we think are imprudent, we think autonomy ought to uh, take precedent. And it's hard to figure out when and when it should. But whatever the answer is in these cases that concern people who are alive, I think we should say the same thing about death. People are probably in a better position to judge how good their life is going to be for them than an outsider. And we just lack the ability uh, to find the perspective of non-human animals since they can't make those sorts of judgments. But when someone is actually expressing an opinion, in the typical cases, I would imagine that they, their epistemic state is better than outsiders to make that judgment. I can imagine exceptions to that, but generally I think they would be able to best guess what would be good for them. Given that you and Mark are discussing interests, something that I'm very curious about, which has become a very important question for accounts of well-being, is do your interests survive your death? In other words, could bad things happen to you after you die? This is a question which can decide uh, whether hedonism is true or not. So hedonism is the view that what's good for you is pleasure and you are doing well in life. You are well off if you are living a life full of pleasure. But of course, if you die and your interests matter, then it seems that what matters more, or at least in addition to pleasure, is that your interests are satisfied. And so then hedonism would be false. So the question is, if you die, could bad things still happen to you because they contradict your interests? On my view, and this might just be uh, because I'm influenced by my old dissertation advisor, Ben Bradley, I'm inclined towards accepting hedonism and I'm inclined to thinking that nothing that happens after your death can be good or bad for you with a uh, few exceptions. So I do think the time at which your death is bad for you is the time at which had you not died, you would have been alive and had a positive well-being love. You would have had more pleasure than pain at the moments in question. And there can be actions that people take after your death that help determine what your life would have been like had your actual death not occurred. People can make choices that affect the times at which your death is good or bad for you. But once you're dead, there's nothing that anyone can do to give you more kind of units of goodness in your life. There's nothing that they can do to have made your life uh, net intrinsically better for you than it was otherwise. So in that respect, I don't think you, know, you have to be concerned about people's posthumous interest. And that puts me at you know, odds with lots of people in the literature. That's not a common sense view upon uh, philosophers, but that is uh, the view that I hold. So just to flesh that out, I want to point out the kind of implications of that view. So let's say while I'm alive, I have a very strong interest in someone not desecrating my corpse. I have a very strong interest in the people that I included in my will to actually get those benefits. So I want to leave everything to my wife and children. Now, if I die, you don't think that I have suffered any harm if a whole bunch of people seriously chop up my corpse, have sex with the body, take all of the assets that would have gone to my wife and burn them uh, or give them to my worst enemy. In no way have I been harmed on your account. Yes, that's right. It does allow that you might be wronged, morally wronged by those actions. Although I find it puzzling to suggest that there are harmless wrongs in this way as well. I think there's strong moral reason not to do that and that in any sort of case we can imagine that's remotely like the real world 
you would be harming more than considerable beings. You might be causing fear. If we didn't have a rule of respecting the wishes of the dead, that would cause a great deal of anxiety for living. And I think that provides itself strong moral reason to respect the wishes of the dead in typical cases. And that my family and friends found out that my corpse was treated in this way, I would think that would probably harm them as well. That might cause them anxiety, although maybe it shouldn't, but it would, and that provide more reason. But yeah, insofar as my interests are at stake, I think even in you know, any sort of extreme case, like the one that you imagine, that you're not harming me at all by doing that. I might question why you'd want to do that, but I don't think it would be harmful for me if you did that. Imagine this case, you go to see your dead father at the morgue and you arrive 10 minutes early and there's the mortician having sex with your father and you recoil in horror and you say, look what you're doing to my dad. And he says, no, 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 no. Your dad's dead. I cannot harm his interests whatsoever. And you say, but I feel like you're, you're harming him. He says, no, but that's totally irrational. He's gone. Any repugnance that you feel really is meaningless. You, you've got a sort of strange preference on this, on this question because this isn't your dad. This is just a, you know, a flashback. So I don't see why you're concerned. And this idea that we should pander to people's anxiety who are concerned about what we do to the dead. Why should we pander to people's bizarro metaphysical beliefs when they're not rooted in reality? And in fact, what we should be doing is spending more time curing them of these anxieties that they have by making them confront it. In fact, what we should do is have more desecration of corpses and people get used to it so they feel less anxious. Because of course, as you say, there are no harmless wrongs. People aren't being harmed in these cases, all that stuff is really just superstition. What's the problem? Also, of course, we can buff up the case and just remove those elements, right? So one, one way of dealing with the case is Mark's way by saying, well, um, let's just show people that these beliefs are irrational and, and through exposure therapy, through desecrating corpses on a regular basis that they loved, we can show them that, that these beliefs are false. But the other way of dealing with it is just to remove that. So can imagine a case where I can desecrate a corpse and then take an amnesia pull after it so that I don't remember doing it and that I, I make sure that that it never gets out. No one ever finds out and it never happens. It has something wrong happened? And on your view, you have to say nothing wrong has happened. I have to make a qualified claim and say nothing objectively wrong has happened. Yeah. With respect to Mark's scenario, I would say to the mortician, the first point that you raise is a good one. You've convinced me. The second point, however, that we should try to rid people of these irrational beliefs is likely to be very cost and labor intensive and not effective. These are not things that I think you could easily change people's minds about, even with something like immersion therapy. So it's best to just respect the wishes of the dead and not desecrate corpse and try to find relationships with living beings. So those will be more meaningful, fulfilling in all likelihood, unless you're very psychologically atypical. But yes, with respect to your example, Jason, I do have to say that nothing objectively morally wrong has happened in my view. It might be the case that something subjectively morally wrong has happened, that relative to the person's evidence about what morality requires of them, they might be acting in a way that's deeply immoral. And if they're doing the thing in question, I think that probably suggests that they have a vicious moral character, perhaps, and that can be worth condemning in itself, even if objectively speaking, that act in question is harmless and not actually wrong. Anymore. But I don't know if that sugars the pill enough, but that, that is the route that I want to go. Yeah, I, th I think it's a good answer. I'm, I'm convinced, but it's a good answer. I I'm curious, given that Mark raised the metaphysics of death, it's not really what we want to talk about, but I just want to raise it to get it out the way. What is death on your view? Are there different views of death and does it matter for what you say? In other words, depending on the view of death, would there be a different outcome as to whether death is bad? Yeah, excellent. So there are different views about what the correct criterion of death is. And I don't take a stance on that. Part of the reason I don't take a stance is it's above my pay grade. It's super difficult and you have to do some kind of hardcore metaphysics and read a lot about biology to try to find an account of death of unifying features that can tell us when any living creature has died, whether it's a human, a non-human animal, a plant or bacteria. And. That is exceedingly difficult to do. I haven't found an answer that is satisfactory in the literature, even though there's a bunch of them. It's this typical for philosophical problems, but I haven't. So I don't take a stance on that. I also don't think that it matters 
for my account. Whether uh, death is bad for you, my view just depends on whether some event in question prevents you from accruing things that are intrinsically good or intrinsically bad. And that applies to any event. So whether we categorize certain things as death or something that's not death, all that matters is whether it deprives you of these goods, not whether we call the event in question death. So for instance, one tricky case, say being cryogenically frozen, if I'm cryogenically frozen for eternity, uh, did I die? I don't know. I'm inclined to think, no, you're neither dead nor alive at that point, but whether it's accurately classified as death or something else doesn't matter to me. What matters is that you're prevented on missing out on this additional good life. And that is bad. So your deprivation view says that death is bad because of the goods that you would be deprived had you not died. Now there's an alternative view, which is the annihilation view. And the annihilation view says, well, death is bad intrinsically. I'm guessing that's what it's saying, right? So annihilation, the very event of being removed from existence, that is bad for you. What are, what are the reasons why you think that view is false? You have given arguments for deprivationism, and I guess those do imply that annihilationism is false, but that annihilationism does seem intuitively strong, right? So it does seem to explain what's going on in those, that, that disanalogy between, uh, human cases and animal cases, when you go to the, the surgeon versus the vet. That seems to explain what's going on there, perhaps more intuitively than on your position. I know that you said your position can explain those intuitions to some extent and the rest of the way you want to, you want to get rid of the intuition, but, but the annihilationist doesn't need to get rid of the intuition, right? So the annihil annihilationist says, well, it makes sense that when we go to the surgeon, he tries to preserve our life. But when I take my dog to the vet, there's not as great an attempt despite suffering later. Why? Well, because human life, th there is more wrong that happens. A worse thing happens. More evil in the world is created when a human life is snuffed out than when an animal life is snuffed out. I think the wording of the last bit is very important, right? So I want to allow that something may be worse from the perspective of the universe happens when a typical human life is snuffed out than when a typical non-human animal's life is snuffed out. But that I think is distinct from the question about whether the event that brought about the death was bad for the creature that died. And the annihilation view I think is actually intuitive insofar as people tend to conflate these two questions whether the event of death is bad for the person or the creature that dies and whether it's impartially bad or bad from the perspective of the universe. So I want to, if Benatar does allow that something of great value, something of great significance, maybe one of the most significant or valuable types of life in the world is ended. And there's something tragic about that, but that doesn't mean that it's bad for the valuable creature that died in any sort of way. The other reason that I don't think the annihilation view helps accommodate that intuition is because as far as I can tell, delaying our death is not going to prevent us from being annihilated. So if annihilation is intrinsically bad for us, I would think the most plausible reading of that is it's going to be as intrinsically bad for me if I die uh, at 35 as if I die at 85. So you don't mitigate the badness of death merely the intrinsic badness of death, merely by delay. I'll say one last thing briefly, the general reason that I'm worried about the annihilation view is that if we say annihilation is intrinsically bad over and above anything else that's bad about death, then we should be able to have trade-offs between the intrinsic badness of annihilation and other intrinsic bads that we might accrue. So. People who defend something like annihilationism, most notably David Benatar, um, but Francis Cam and uh, Stephen Blodhead both alluded to something along these lines as well. I'll say, tell me exactly how bad annihilation is for you. Exactly how much intrinsic badness you can accrue by annihilation. And then I can imagine a case where you could accrue some other intrinsic badness that's less bad than annihilation by stipulation and you'll avoid annihilation forever. So if you're not annihilated, when you're cryogenically frozen, or if you're not annihilated, when you're put in a consciousless coma, then we can imagine that you can accrue some sort of pain, some sort of physical suffering, which is clearly intrinsically bad. And then you're cryogenically frozen for eternity, or 
if that does result in not your annihilation, we'll imagine you continue to exist, but with a well-being level of zero, you have no pleasure, no pain. You have no other desire satisfied. And I don't think it's worth taking on any pain in order to live a continued existence that doesn't contain any goods for you whatsoever. I wouldn't take any amount of pain in order to merely avoid being annihilated and exist forever with nothing else good in my life. So it's for, for the reason questions about trade-offs lead to seemingly absurd conclusions. I'm skeptical about positive annihilation as an additional thing. That's intrinsically bad. I wonder if the event of annihilation is bad for you, depending on your particular set of circumstances. So you can imagine the situation where you've got the person who is in enormous pain and we say, look, it's overall better for you to be deprived of that pain and to, to die, but it is still bad that you are being annihilated. You know, Benetar's view is that overall it would have been better had you never been born, then you would never have had to confront the suffering or the death. So you, you're faced with these two horrible options. The one is to have ongoing pain and the other one is to die. And it might be that because the pain is so significant, it is better to die, but it is still bad intrinsically to be annihilated. I wonder about this case. So it might be that imagine that you had the capacity to, to be immortal, um, and you'd lived for millennia much so that you'd experienced every possible thing that you could in your life. And so now you no longer have the capacity to have meaningful experiences, enjoy things because everything's just boring because you've done it so many times already. And you might think at that point that uh, annihilation becomes a, a good thing. In other words, ending the ceaseless cycle of monotony would be good, but it's only because you've reached the cap of your life that it can change its status, that being annihilated under those circumstances might be the kind of thing that the immortal being would see as a good in and of itself. I do wonder if it would be a good in and of itself or whether it is about a matter of saying, well, look, monotony is, even if you think I'm at zero on the utility scale zero is actually unpleasant. If you think about watching a very average movie, you often say, I, I'd prefer it if I didn't watch that thing, but it would have been better if I didn't have to undergo that experience. Not that it was the worst thing ever. Um, but you can imagine monotony or zeros being converted into negative experiences because they're, they're dull and it'd be better not to experience them. It would be better to be annihilated at that point. I, I don't think zero could be understood as being bad for you. I think of this as just a sort of stipulative definition to refer to life that doesn't have any goods or bads, but that is just a tangential point. I think your larger point is that if we're imagining immortality would be bad for you for the sort of reasons that Bernard Williams raises, uh, and your life maybe doesn't contain a lot of pain and suffering, but it's meaningless. You don't find any enjoyment in it. That seems to be a negative life. That seems to clearly be enough life, not worth living. And in that case, I would say on my, uh, deprivation, standard deprivation view that it just says it'd be good for you to, uh, be annihilated because it would prevent you from missing out on that bad. I don't think that annihilation can be intrinsically bad for you in some circumstances, uh, but not intrinsically bad for you in others without, or you can't posit that without raising a whole host of axiological questions that I think would be very puzzling and very bizarre. And if the standard deprivation view can account for this judgment, that it'd be better for you to go out of existence now than continue living a life where you have no additional goods whatsoever. And it's just devoid of meaning. You don't have any desires to carry on living. Then we should go with the simpler route there for reasons of parsimony. So one of the concerns with the deprivation view is that if we're trying to add up your future expected goods, it seems that the worst case scenario is, let's say the fetus dying and the best case scenario would be like an elderly person dying because we're comparing the future goods. But it seems strange to, to think, and I think it would be a bad thing if someone miscarries and you might say, you could imagine there was this potential for this child that would have been born, but we don't traditionally mourn those deaths in the same way that we, let's say, mourn the death of a 20 year old. So if all that you care about is these future experiences in the abstract, what they could have been, it seems to miss out on something quite pivotable, which is what they mean for the being. And uh, I'm not sure if the deprivation view can take that into account. Yeah, right. This is, a, I think, one of the biggest objections that can be raised against the deprivation view, and it's pushed people like Jeff McMahon to try to seriously amend the view to avoid the seemingly counterintuitive consequences. 
the way that I want to handle those cases is the same way that I wanted to handle the case of the annihilation view and ending the life of the human versus the non-human animal, which is to appeal to the distinction between how bad an event is for a creature and how bad it is from the perspective of the universe. So you're absolutely right that my view entails that the prudentially worst time to die is the time at which you would miss out on the most good life. And that will, in typical cases, be the moment that you come into existence. But there's a difference, I think, between the moral status of a very early stage fetus, especially if the fetus isn't even sentient, and a teenager who's already lived a bunch of life, has all of these connections with other people in the world, has desires about how they want their future life to go, has plans that they've worked towards for many years. So it could be the case that if we were in a triage situation and we had to save one of the lives, we should save the teenager's life, even though their death would be less bad for them than the fetus of life we can imagine would be for the fetus. That's how I want to handle that. And that's even setting aside complications about personal identity. It might not be the case that the, your teenage self is identical with a zygote or with an early stage uh, fetus. And if identity isn't maintained, then the death of a fetus might not be bad for it at all. It just hinges on what it means for us to continue to exist over time. I find that very interesting because when I saw this objection raised, it seems to me very intuitive that you'd want to save the teenager, even on your view on deprivationism rather than the, the infant uh, or the fetus. Why? Well, because the objection only goes through if you assume that all things being equal, life is good. If you don't make that assumption and you say, well, all things being equal, if you look at the average person's life, it's pretty shit. And life for the teenager perhaps is more likely to be good because there are these events that have been locked in already. There's a lot that can go wrong to that fetus's life before it gets to teenage years, whereas if we stipulate the case that we're talking about a happy teenager, well, then so many of those events have already been locked in as positive. And so the trajectory of that teenager's life is much more likely, all things being equal, to be a good life, whereas the fetus's life doesn't have that guarantee yet. That hinges on, on the important empirical question about how good the average life is for each person. And it's hard for me to know with any sort of confidence what the answer is to that case. What you said could very well be true, in which case there could be an additional reason to favor saving the life of the teenager or the life of the fetus, even if the death of the fetus would be worse for the fetus than the death of the teenager would be for the teenager. Something I want to raise going back to the annihilation view is just consider the experience of dying, right? So we're not now talking about the event that death has happened, and we're not now talking about what happens after death. We're talking about the experience of death. So just for a moment, let's imagine someone is pushed off a building and they fall. That experience, the moments just before of death, of, of the thoughts around my annihilation, those seem like terrible thoughts. Those seem so bad that they would offset a, a lot of what would happen after my death. On your view, something bad has happened because I would have lived a slightly happy life if I hadn't died. But on my view, something horrendous has happened because I've been pushed off that building. Not just slightly bad, but horrendous. And maybe your view can't account for that. I can't account for the terror that you feel as you're about to die in terms of how bad your death is for you. But the terror that you feel is presumably causing you a great deal of negative emotions. It's so very emotionally painful. And I think that is intrinsically bad and that factors into how well your life went for you as a whole. I can imagine cases where the terror that you feel there is even worse than the additional good that you miss out on. I mean, we'd have to spill the details of exactly how much terror you feel, exactly what your life would have been like. But I, I think I could allow that in all sorts of possible cases we can imagine. The worst thing about the conjunction of the process of dying and death itself is the horrible anxiety that you feel right as you're about to die. The more ways in which I can take these other features that are in everyday cases tied very closely with the event of death itself and point to those and say, that also is very tragic. And that factors into our kind of overall assessment of death. Because when we think about death, we don't typically uh, 
draw a sharp distinction between the event of death itself and the process of dying, between prudential concerns and moral concerns. But m the deprivation view is just at bottom a view about how extrinsically bad all things considered death is for the person that died. Not a view about the importance of the creature that died. It's not a view about how bad the process of dying is. Not a view about how bad your death is from the perspective of the world or for other people. And all of these are resources that I can draw from, uh, supplement my deprivation as you would to try to accommodate these intuitions that I think people like David Benatar and Francis Cam and Stephen Bloody and Jeff McMahon, they all want to try to accommodate these. But I think I can accommodate these by appealing to these other considerations that don't strictly speaking concern how bad death itself is for the person who died. So the Epicurean view is that your death cannot be bad for you because you are not there for it. So you cease to exist at the moment of your death. So it's not bad. And from what I gather, David Benatar has an interesting objection to it, which is to say, if you take a view like that seriously, it's hard to explain the wrongness of certain kinds of killings. So the deprivationist account is going to say, well, what's wrong with death is you're missing out on this future good. But again, we can imagine someone who will have no future goods. Either their life will be at net zero or will have, you know, uh, a life of suffering. So it's going to have some minus value. So they're not deprived of anything. If there's nothing intrinsically bad about their death, in fact, as you say, it's good for them. Well, then you might be doing something good by killing them. And then if anyone objected to this murder, you'd say, but I've done the right thing. What's, what's the wrong in me ending this person's life? They weren't there for the death. Let's say I did it in a way when they were asleep. So they had none of the terror, none of the experience of dying. Um, you could be done in a totally painless way. They're deprived of nothing. In fact, maybe I've conferred a, a net overall benefit on them because they missed out on some bad thing. You can imagine the sort of mercy killing nurse who has all the information for us. She can look at your charts and she says, look, sorry, man. It just seems like from here on out, you're on a negative utility slope. So while you're asleep, I'm just going to inject you know, put too much morphine into your drip and you'll cease to exist. And it seems like I'm doing a good thing. I haven't, their annihilation isn't bad. You're not deprived of anything. So what's the problem? I think it's worth thinking about two different cases here. So one where the subsequent life would be bad for the person if they lived it. And one where the subsequent life would be good for the person. And I think there's a plausible argument to be made that you're doing something morally wrong by seemingly paternalistically killing them when you think that their life, even though you think that their life would be bad for them if they continue to live it. Uh, and that might be because we think you should respect people's autonomy, even if respecting their autonomy means that we allow them to do things that are imprudent for themselves. But the objection that David Benatar raises for the Epicurean seems to apply to cases in which someone's life would be good for them as well. Because the Epicurean has to say, no matter, you can have the best life possible if you continue living. But nevertheless, the event of death itself would be bad. And then that does raise the question about whether we could permissibly kill someone. If we're not doing anything bad for them, what could be wrong about killing them? Now, one answer is, well, it's bad for the family and stuff, but you can just ramp up the thought experiment and imagine you have a button that'll bring about the destruction of the world and painlessly kill everyone. The Epicurean has to say, you're not doing anything that's bad for anyone. And a plausible principle of morality seems to be if some action, if you want to do some action and it doesn't harm anyone ever, then it's permissible to do that action. Now, contemporary Epicureans have a way around this. So the objection doesn't apply, but their way around it requires them to take on something that's even more problematic. So every, as far as I can tell, living person who self-identifies as an Epicurean will draw some sort of funny distinction where they'll say, well, it's not bad for you but it does cause you to miss out on more good. And you have moral reasons to prevent people from missing out on more good, just like you have moral reasons to prevent them from having bad things happen to them. And that's why it's wrong. You're not harming them, but you're preventing them from missing out on good. So the, the different Epicureans use different language, different terms to try to draw this distinction, but they all essentially say the same thing, that we should respect the interests of people who's continued like, okay. So then the killing objection doesn't apply, but my objection in those cases is, well, now you're just saying the same thing that I'm saying. You're saying the same thing that a deprivationist is just in different terms. So you don't think death is bad for people, but you do think we have prudential reason to avoid it because it causes you to miss out on additional good life. And that prudential reason can also ground moral reasons. And then I'm not sure that we're saying anything different from one another. We're just using terms like bad, poor, and harm differently from one another.
And I'm not interested in the correct use of these terms. I think we can stipulate our definitions. I'm interested in what sorts of choices we should make about end of life decisions and what sort of choices we should make about procreation and all of these kind of complicated ethical questions. Something which has come up a few times, but we've never explored it is how do you weight good and bad? How do you weight things that happen to you that are good versus things that happen to you that are bad? Are they equally weighted? Would you trade off the one against the other and you'd be in a position of neutrality or is bad weighted higher than good? Yeah, this depends on the correct account of well-being. Since I'm inclined towards accepting hedonism, I think uh, there has to be some sort of pleasure states that are just as good for you as some sort of pain states are bad for you. And I would want to say, weight them equally. Ben Bradley has a short uh, discussion reply to David Benatar in the asymmetry, where he shows that if you say that pleasure is weighted differently than pain, you raise all sorts of axiological concerns. You have to say all sort of wacky stuff about how to compare these trade-offs. So we should treat them equally. And that's the route that I want to go as well. If you accept the kind of desire satisfaction theory, where you think what's good or bad for you is having your desire to afford it. There's an answer there that David Boonen gets in his latest book, which is just, what would you desire between these two states? Any, you can compare any two possible outcomes and then whichever your part in that case, that would be uh, what's good for you. So the trade-offs might be different for different people, depending on what their preference set is, but there'd be a sort of principled way to adjudicate any sort of possible trade-off scenario. I wonder if there's certain kinds of goods that are just incomparable. So we might think of certain kinds of experiences that are so awful that they make a life overall not worth living. So you can imagine someone who has a generally pleasant life, they have friends, family, a good job, but their life will end in being tortured to death over a period of two weeks. And if you said to someone in advance, beginning, look, this is how your life will end. If we add up the pleasure and the pain, it does come out positive good because there were so many periods of of pleasure during that time. And relatively, this, this is a short period of extreme pain. The person might say it's not worth it. And on the contrary view, you might have someone who has, let's say, a rather monotonous life with continual aches and pains and things like that. But it ends in some absolutely euphoric way, some like exceptional experience that's just groundbreaking, something fundamentally meaningful. You discover the cure for cancer or you create this incredible novel, something like that. And we say, well, again, when we do the utility calc, it looks like it was overall uh, negative. And the person says, but I think there was a life worth living because there was this fundamentally incredible event that could have occurred. So as the hedonist, it seems like you want to translate everything down to a single util or hedonic currency. And I wonder if that's always going to be fair, or if there's a point where we say, look, these goods are incommensurate and it can't just be boiled down to one currency. So I, I'm going to have to just dig in my heels here, but I want to note that there's good arguments to the contrary. So I think this is a complicated question. It's a paper by David Blumenfeld, there's a thing called Living Life Over Again. He imagines a sort of like Nietzschean eternal recurrence and suggests that sometimes it can be uh, perfectly rational to decline to live your life over again if you're given the option, if it contained some parts that were just so horrific that you just didn't want to deal with that again, even if you agree that the good outweighed the bad. And he gives a real life harrowing example of a friend of his who had uh, stage four cancer, I believe it was stage four cancer, had to undergo years of chemotherapy and survived and lived at, was alive at the time of writing. He'd lived for, I think maybe a decade or something after that and was very happy and had a lot of good life ahead of him. And he had said, you know, if I knew what I was getting myself into when I decided to undergo the cancer treatment, I would have chosen to have ended my life, even though it was successful and even though I'm benefited from it because I believe that the good that I'm getting outweighed the bad, but the, it was just so traumatic that it's not worth going through even to get some sort of addition. And I understand that compulsion. And I think I would be similarly disposed towards some events that are just so horrific. If I were faced with the option, I think I would choose to opt out of those, even if uh, I believe the good outweighed the bad. You take an extreme example, God exists, but he's a bit malevolent and says, I'm, I will give you a billion years of goodness, but you have to undergo 10,000 years of torture first, just the most painful torture you can imagine. 
And the goodness is definitely going to outweigh the bad, but you have to suffer the torture first. And then you could just opt for non-existence at any point in time. I think psychologically, I'm just not strong enough to make myself undergo all of that torture, even knowing that I would get the good of the end. A a crazy would make me end my life to avoid that torture. But I still think I, it would be prudentially required of me to undergo all of the bad in order to get the good, if the good outweighs the bad. So I'm just, I, it's a frustrating flat-footed response, but I'm just going to dig in my heels and say, yes, I do think that's true. It, you should always do what's going from a prudential standpoint, but to maximize the good for you, even if you have to undergo some extremely painful, traumatizing experiences. If the good outweighs the bad, that's what you ought to do. But also at the same time, acknowledging that I might not make that choice, that that choice that I'd make would be irrational by my own lights. It seems to me like when you ask that question is very important. Should I have continued my life knowing that things would be very bad followed by fine? Should I have ended my life? And there's something interesting about the human psychology is that when things are bad for an extended period of time, we experience time dilation. We experience that time as being shorter than it really was. And we don't remember the suffering as vividly as, as when we experienced it at the time. But we also seem to, on the opposite side, remember pleasure as in more detail than, than it really happened. And we remember it very vividly and, and time moves in the other direction. When it comes to pleasure, we experience those moments as being drawn out. We remember every facet of them. And so it seems like the question of whether you would end your life, it would depend very much on when you ask it, whether it's during the pain, in which case you're experiencing its full duration or after when you experienced it in a smaller amount, you experience it as shorter in duration than it really was. I believe David Benatar cites some empirical studies uh, about this in the human predicament and suggests that this means people's self-assessment uh, maybe on their deathbed is unreliable. And yeah, that could very well be the case. And that should make us more epistemically humble about our judgments about how good our life was for us on the whole. That combined with our temporal bias. So people seem to care more about goods and bads in the future and not at all about goods and bads in the past, at least in so far as they remain in the past. This was demonstrated by Parfit in Reasons of Persons. He imagines this famous hospital case where you wake up in the hospital and a nurse tells you that you either got a surgery that was say five hours of excruciating pain, that you were then given uh, a pill that induced amnesia to avoid remembering this trauma forever, or you're about to get that operation, but they've improved. And now it'll only be one hour of horrifying, excruciating pain followed by an amnesia inducing pill that'll make you forget it. Seems objectively speaking, it's better for you to suffer horribly for one hour than it would for five. But most people, Parker rightly predicts, would prefer that they already had the terrible operation in the past rather than the less bad operation in the future. So after we experience some terrible traumatic event, to your point, the fact that we might be downplaying how bad it was for us and not playing the good things in our life and our temporal bias might warp our judgments about whether we made the right decision in choosing to live rather than ending up. So I wonder which assessment we should care about. Is it that from the perspective of the universe calculation, or is it a matter of asking someone how they think their life is going and, and, and taking that as if it were accurate, even in cases where it's not accurate? So David Benatar talks about people having a Pollyanna syndrome where they'll adjust their environment. So they'll say, oh, things aren't nearly as bad. I know I can't use my legs anymore, but it's okay. I've had to learn, learn how to do other things in my life and I've gained all these other benefits. And you, if you're that kind of a person who always looks on the bright side, you have this warped view of reality. And the question is whether we should say, well, that's the bit that counts. If most people, when you ask them, are you glad that you were born? report yes, even if it turns out that from the perspective of the universe that they're wrong, you should take them at their word because really the subjective account of how their life is going is the only thing that really matters. No one really has access to that utility calculator in the sky. I don't want to say the subjective perspective is the only thing that matters, but since we don't have access to the utility calculus in the sky, I think the best that we can do is try to assess relative evidence, how good people's life for them are. As a whole, I think typically people will be in a better place to uh, 
judge that than others, with some notable exceptions. The other reason to respect it is that trying to give people the correct view. If you, if you think, I actually think most people's lives are uh, good for them on the whole, most likely the considerations that we just discussed, notwithstanding. Um, but the other reason is, you know, suppose you think someone is grossly miscalculating how bad their life is for them. And you can, you only have two options. You can either reveal the truth to them that their life is utterly horrible <laughs> for them and every, you know, they're just being way too optimistic about it, or you can let them remain optimistic. It seems like revealing the truth in that case, if that's your only option is going to be bad for them. So one of the things we have to consider when we use the term, maybe respect people's view is what the like kind of consequences on their well-being of trying to get them to see or have certain beliefs about how good or bad their life is. For them. So there might be more reason not to try to ruin someone's optimistic delusion. In certain cases. Yeah, it seems to me that's one of the problems with this utilitarian account is that if all you care about is pleasure, well, and there aren't these other kinds of freestanding values like truth, well, you should lie away to people. You should encourage their delusions. Why make people confront the cold, hard reality when they can be blissfully happy? So it seems like you might even have obligations on that account to lie and delude and feed into their fantasies as much as you can, even if it's totally divorced from reality. People derive an enormous amount of comfort from believing in an afterlife or from believing in angels and pixies and whatever else. It seems that if you just care about pleasure, well, play into it. It seems to be good for them. Whereas someone who believes in freestanding values like truth is going to say, well, better to lead an authentic life that's engaged with what reality really is. Better to be uh, Socrates to satisfied than a pig satisfied. Yeah. So I'm going to say this is a virtue, not a bug of utilitarianism. And it is e even mill utilitarian. I, I can't understand how to coherently maintain this distinction between higher and lower pleasures. It's better, prudentially better to be a pig satisfied <laughs> and Socrates dissatisfied on my view. But I don't think the, uh, objection is as serious as it may sound initially, because in many cases in which lying to someone is going to seem objectionable, I think that's going to be because them learning the truth is going to allow them to make better informed decisions about how to lead their life, how to treat others. I mean, truth is uh, unquestionably extrinsically valuable for all sorts of reasons. And that can be pretty much justify our social practices. And the exceptions to that are ones where I think you really should lie. Uh, I don't know if anyone thinks that truth is so important that you should make sure that someone realizes the truth when it's going to make them suffer and not have any other tangible benefits. If someone is on their deathbed, let's say, and they believed that they you know, wrote a great poem and you care about truth above all else. And you say, no, actually, no, this person who told you your poetry was really good. They were just being nice to you. And they told me in secret that you're just a garbage poet and you had no hope of redemption. So they didn't even bother to try to, no one thinks like truth matters so much that that you should just make people suffer when there's no other sort of, uh, goods that you get out of. So I said, lie to them about the quality of their life and lie to them about the quality of their poetry, if it's going to benefit them. David Benatar has what he calls this asymmetry view, where he says the presence of pleasure is good. The presence of pain is bad. The absence of pain is actively good, but the absence of pleasure is merely neutral. And on that basis, he says, in principle, it's always better never to have been born. So because you, you're not missing out on anything because the absence of pleasure is merely neutral. And then he wants to buff it up by saying, look, if you confront the nature of reality, being born is going to lead to a, a life that's a lot less meaningful than you think it's going to be. It's going to have a lot more uh, pain than, than you think it's going to have. So you ought not to have been born and it's wrong to bring new life into the world. So maybe you shouldn't tell people for their own sake, why their lives are so, you know, meaningless and painful, but you should tell them if they have an intention of bringing life into the world, because they're going to cause a, a harm or a wrong to this new future being, and it'd be better for that not to occur. What's your assessment of that view? Yeah, I'm inclined to reject the asymmetry, not for original reasons, but just because I found this discussion note that Ben Bradley wrote in the journal of ethics and social philosophy, a very convincing, it's, I believe called Benatar and the logic of betterness. And there's just no way that I can make sense of this asymmetry axiologically. That said, I do want to say something about the procreation asymmetry that I think is maybe not quite in the spirit of Benatar, but 
is going to capture the intuition to some degree. So I think there is moral reason to create people that would live happy lives. But the moral reason lacks what's called a requiring force. So we can never be obligated, on my view, to create happy people. Because if we don't create happy people, then there's no person that has moral status ever that is harmed. Right? So even if there's some sense of which is bad for a person to not come into existence, if their life would be happy, they never exist. They never have moral status. So we don't have to take their interest into consideration on my view, even though they do give us moral reasons to create them. On the flip side though, the moral reason to not create someone who has a life that's so terrible, that it's not worth living, I think that can have requiring force, right? So if I could prevent someone from coming to existence, that would have a life that's so miserable it'd be better for them to never exist at all. I think that has requiring force because if I don't act on that, then I'm harming a being who will have moral status. Namely, they'll have moral status once they exist and they're suffering terribly. And that would, there, I can point to someone that would be wrong in that case. So I think there's an asymmetry between the moral reasons that we have to create happy people and to prevent the creation of people that would have lives not worth living, but not an asymmetry just between the absence of pleasure and the absence of pain. And I'm also inclined to think, contrary to Benatar, that the utility calculation is going to work out in favor of most people, such that the amount of pleasure or good that they get in their life will be greater than the amount of bad, without downplaying how bad people's lives can be.